Hello, coming at you this day. Uh, it's uh, Wednesday. Um, as you may have uh, heard already today, uh, the governor has issued a uh, two-week uh, period of staying at home. And so uh, please uh, remember to heed that um, heed that, and the distancing and washing hands and all the stuff that's coming with it so that we can uh, find a way to be out and about together once again. Uh, just a note along those lines, um, uh, Julie Larson Williams of Bob um, uh, went to church today and picked up some of the items that we had uh, donated for Chum and the food pantry, and they brought those items down there and saw that it was pretty severely diminished uh, as far as the items uh, for folks in need to pick up. Um, and so since this order came out to stay at home, it's probably not um, smart or realistic to go out and, and get things and have picked up or dropped off uh, to to stock the, the pantry. Um, but just a reminder uh, that, that Julie and Bob wanted everybody to know um, is that uh, for every $1 that uh, Chum can receive, uh, they can turn that into $7 uh, worth of groceries. So uh, if you'd like to send uh, some money uh, toward Chum, I'm sure it would be much appreciated during this time of uh, kind of some crazy hardship for some folks beyond the normal kind of hardship that people go through. And not quite sure how um, uh, the... Uh, two-week uh, stay-at-home order will affect our uh, Sunday worship recording either yet. We're trying to, to figure that out if we'll be able to get together uh, to do that or find a different way. So I'm going to continue on with our reading from uh, from uh, Knowing Jesus by James Allison. Once again, sometimes a little bit heady, sometimes uh, some good little nuggets in there. Uh, he's talking about the resurrection and helping us to get ready uh, for Holy Week and the Easter season uh, as well. So I'm going to read a little bit from there, beginning with something I finished with last time. The ascension was the introduction of a novelty into heaven, human nature. Being human was from then on permanently and indissolubly involved in the presence of God. However, the issue of the ascension is for my purpose here and aside. What is important is that the risen and crucified Jesus was no less human after his resurrection than before it. This not always says something about the presence of human nature in heaven, but something about the presence of God on earth. The divine life is indissolubly and permanently present as human. All divine dealings with humanity are on a human level. Now this may sound like some sort of clever exercise in logic. It is nothing of the sort, I think rather that it's this sort of insistence which helps us to relativize a whole lot of pious thinking. It means that being religious or knowing Jesus can have nothing to do with fleeting, fleeing upwards, with escaping from being human, avoiding being flesh and blood, being moved by bodies and emotions. If the Church understands sacraments to be the ordinary means by which divine life is available to humans, illustrates this, for sacraments are all to do with the physical celebrations by which divine life penetrates our human histories. I insist on this now, not primarily for its own sake, but because unless we understand that, two things become really quite incomprehensible. If Jesus had not risen as a human being, he could have floated about indefinitely, appearing and disappearing. Yet the apostolic witness clearly makes a distinction between Jesus and the Holy Spirit, Jesus had to go because he was a particular human being, not a general ghostly presence. It was his going that made possible the coming of the Holy Spirit, not because the Holy Spirit is a general ghostly presence, but because the Holy Spirit is not a particular human being. It is important to understand, however, that while the Holy Spirit is not a particular human being, what it makes present to the apostles is made present on an entirely human level. Again, this is not an easy point to make, so let me recap what I've been trying to do. I've been trying to fill out the density of the presence of the risen Lord to the apostles, so as to give some possibility of our entering into the experience which they had, to which they bear witness, and which is normative for any experience of Jesus which we might have. At a certain point after the resurrection, the apostles ceased to receive experiences of the particular human being Jesus of Nazareth. 
and started to receive a slightly different experience which had to do with, but was not the same as their previous experience of Jesus. I'd like to explore that a little. So what was the difference between the way Jesus was present to the apostles in his resurrection appearances and his presence thereafter? Well, I've underlined two ways of Jesus being present to them, his actual physical presence by which he appeared, they could touch him and he could eat fish, and along with that, and as part of it, the gratuitous forgiving presence that called them out of themselves towards the other whom they found difficult to recognize, and which gradually transformed their lives. These two came together in the case of the apostles. They do not come together for us. The physical appearances of Jesus came to an end after an interval which Luke puts at the symbolic figure of 40 days, though the period, the surprise appearance to Saul was later. During that period, Jesus taught them about the kingdom of God and helped the fullness of the novelty of the resurrection sink in. Then he ascended to heaven, and shortly thereafter the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. That's how Luke presents it. John's approach is rather different. He is Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit into the apostles on the first evening of the resurrection. Then Jesus carries on appearing for a time, but there's no Pentecost in John. Jesus breathes the Spirit, saying, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And Luke, the Father, sends the Holy Spirit from on high. And in John, Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit. But in both cases, the Spirit is the Spirit of the risen Lord, the Spirit that was in Christ. The Spirit constantly makes present the crucified and risen Lord thus perpetually reproducing those changes of relationship which the risen Lord had started to produce as a result of his resurrection. What I'm trying to say is that outside the group of apostles who were physical witnesses to the resurrected Lord, no one gets to see the physically risen Lord. But instead, all the really important elements of the resurrection, the eruption into our lives of gratuity as forgiveness, permitting a recasting of relationships, all that is made constantly available to us by the Holy Spirit so that we are able to become witnesses to the resurrection in our own lives. This is all laid out clearly in the great and mysterious speeches in John's Gospel, chapters 14 to 17. Jesus talks of the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He would teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And again, he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit and the risen Lord are not simply identical any more than Jesus and the Father are simply identical. There is, in both cases, a relationship to someone who is other than and yet the same as Jesus. For present purposes, we need not look too hard at the Trinitarian aspect yet. Suffice it to say that what the Holy Spirit brings is the whole life and death of the risen Lord reproducing that life in the lives and deaths of the faithful so that they become witnesses to that risen life and death. The Holy Spirit is the giving of himself by Jesus to us to be killed in obedience to the Father and the giving back of his life to Jesus by the Father simultaneously. That is what I think is meant by the Spirit that is in Christ. It is a spirit of self-giving made present through the concrete human life and death of Jesus. To put it crudely, it is the internal workings of the life and death of Jesus. It is what informed his relationship with the Father and with us, and the Father's relationship with him and with us. The dynamic that was at work in all that, that is the Holy Spirit. It is important to grasp that there aren't other bits of the Holy Spirit which we might experience instead that are separate from and nothing to do with the presence of the life and death of the crucified and risen Lord. The Holy Spirit is not some vague, numinous force that is somehow bigger and less exclusive than the crucified and risen Jesus, and rather nicer, perhaps having to do with peace and joy and so on, rather than murder and violence. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the crucified and risen Jesus, and any joy, peace, and so on that is genuinely of the Holy Spirit is essentially linked to the presence of the crucified and risen one. Far from being reduced by the link with the crucified and risen Jesus, 
the Spirit was precisely made maximally present and available because of the crucifixion and resurrection. All the power and self-giving of God that went into the crucifixion and resurrection is perpetually present in the Holy Spirit and so perpetually present to all of us who receive it. I had a really hard time uh, finding the uh, my guitar hymn book that had the songs for Lent and Easter in it, um, but I finally found it, and so I get to do a, a Lent song, perhaps one that's not super familiar, but uh, it's called As the Sun with Longer Journey. As the sun with longer journey melts the winter snow and ice With its slowly growing radiance warms the seed beneath the earth May the sun of Christ uprising gently bring our hearts to life Through the days of waiting, watching in the desert of our sin Searching on the far horizon for a sign of cloud or wind of our Savior's victory. Praise be given to the Maker of the seasons yearly round, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Source, Sustainer, Lord of life, as the ever-turning ages roll to 